Well, good morning, class. Welcome back to Life of Christ. We're going to actually pick up right where we left off in our last class, and that was we were looking at Holy Week. <coughs> Excuse me. And we were looking particularly at Holy Saturday and reviewing sort of some uh, some theories that would that sort of naturalistic um, worldview has used to. Um, try to explain the resurrection. And, and so I want to pick up on that. Uh, and basically this morning, as we're thinking about the empty tomb, as we're thinking about Resurrection Sunday, I want to piggyback on that and go, okay, if these are inadequate theories, so we looked at the swoon theory, the theft theory, the hallucination theory, and the wrong tomb theater, theory, I mentioned then that these do not have the explanatory power that they need. In, in other words, one of the theories might answer maybe one or two of the nagging questions, but it often, well, every one of them should often, they always leave off a bunch of other nagging questions. And then in some cases, the question that they do answer, um, it creates another question. So, so for example, the swoon theory, you'll remember, uh, would postulate that not only did Jesus not rise from the dead, but that Jesus didn't die. Okay, so that answers one question, that answers the resurrection, and that is the answer is, well, he didn't actually rise from the dead, he uh, merely swooned. Remember, the in the tomb, he sort of regained consciousness because of the cool air, and so that's how we explain the resurrection. That's, that's fine if we want to have that argument or that, you know, dialogue, but the problem is, what that view demands is that Jesus didn't die. And therefore what that view demands is that the Romans don't know how to kill, which is highly suspect, right? So it answers one question, you know, it solves one problem here, but it creates another one over there. And so with, with, with looking at what I would call those inadequate theories, I want to really just review some of what we find in Stein. I think it's chapter 19. Um, yeah review some of the arguments for or the evidences for an actual bona fide physical resurrection of Jesus. And so I'm just going to re review, I'm going to run through this pretty quick because they are review and just, and just try to summarize them for you from 30,000 feet. One evidence would be the multiple attestation of the empty tomb. That is to say, all four of the canonical gospels record for us an empty tomb. And I would just say very briefly that, that there are, of course, differing accounts um, when you get down into the minutia of those four Gospels. I would argue that that actually offers us positive proof for their historicity. And uh, you can chew on that. Maybe the question would be, well, what would give us greater um, historical um, reliability if the four gospels word for word verbatim all recorded exactly the same thing, or if there were differing emphases and nuances. And I would argue that the differing emphases and nuances of the four canonical gospels actually lend credence to the fact that they are recording something that was historical um, rather than just sort of cheat sheet, you know, copy and paste or something like that. We also have the proclamation of Jesus's resurrection, which assumes the empty tomb. I mentioned this in our last lecture when we were talking about some of those inadequate theories. The Christian religion would not have been able to get off of the ground. It, it wouldn't have made it past Monday. It wouldn't have got out of Jerusalem um, if Jesus was still in the tomb. And, and furthermore, all the Jews, the religious leaders, or all the Romans, the governing authorities, all they had to do to stamp out Christianity on day one was to pull out the corpse of Jesus and let everybody know that this whole thing is a farce. And had they done that, it would have been game over. But the fact that um, the apostles proclaim Jesus's resurrection and the fact that the empty tomb or the fact that the body is not presented leads us to believe that the tomb in fact was empty. Evidence number three, this is one, don't get mad. I guess this would be uh, Celine and Mariana. Uh, women were witnesses of the empty tomb, and, and you might go, well, how is that an evidence? Well, this is, uh, you know, pre-Me Too movement. Um, this is pre-Believe All Women. This is, um, yeah, this is 
in a culture and in a context and in a historical moment in which, to be quite candid, the testimony of women in ancient time, particularly in Judaism, was actually prohibited. Uh, if you were a woman, uh, you were not allowed to be a bona fide witness in the court of law. That's how little um, credence was given to you if you were chromosome challenged. Um, and so again, the very fact that the gospel writers record for us that it is the women who discover the empty tomb leads us to believe once again that it, they're recording history. If they were going to whitewash something or sugarcoat it or embellish or exaggerate, uh, you certainly, you know, in other words, if, if you wanted to, to, to make something look good, to appeal to the culture, again, to get traction, you wouldn't have the women doing this. You wouldn't have the women sort of being the heroes and discovering the empty tomb while the disciples are cowering in the corner with the shades drawn and the door locked. Again, this gives us evidence that something genuine is taking place here. Number four, the fact of the empty tomb was acknowledged by the Jews. This is, <clears throat> this is an interesting one just to reflect upon. It's, it's analogous to Jesus's own earthly, oh, sorry about that. It's analogous to Jesus's own earthly ministry in that the religious elite, they never disputed Jesus's miracles they simply attributed them to something else. In other words, when Jesus would perform a miracle, the religious leaders always granted that the miracle had been done. Again, it was objective, it was verifiable. Um, what they did though is ascribe it, you know, for example, to Beelzebub. In other words, they would say, this man is not possessed by the spirit of God, he's possessed by the spirit of, of Satan or of a demon. In, a, in an analogous way, um, when it comes to the empty tomb, the controversy surrounded not that it happened, but rather how to explain it. Again, it's the same sort of flavor. Uh, the, the, religious, uh, the religious leaders, the Jews, they did not dispute the empty tomb. They just disputed that Jesus got up from the dead. It's fascinating to ponder. Number five, oh, and this, this you know, is a refutation here to the, the, the theft theory that we saw in our last class, but, but the empty tomb was a well-known tomb. Uh, and because the tomb was well known, uh, the women and the disciples and the Jews and the Romans, they all knew where it was and could have found it. And then they simply could have presented the body. Again, the fact that none of this happens demands an explanation. Number six, the empty tomb actually accounts for Sunday worship. Again, to, to put ourselves sort of in the historical context, we need to somehow account for the fact that these early followers of Jesus began to worship together on Sunday. And for you and I, we sort of take that for granted. Um, that's all that we've ever known in our lifetimes. But we need to remember that all the followers of Jesus, at least the original followers of Jesus, were all Jews who for millennia, quite literally, had worshiped on the Sabbath or Saturday. And now all of a sudden, they have transferred the Sabbath to Sunday. They've transferred their day of rest and worship from Saturday to Sunday. So the question is, how, does it, how do we account for this cataclysmic shift? And I think what we could say or what we could argue is that, well, something cataclysmic did take place, and that is that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, got up from the dead on the first day of the week, and that changed everything. Lastly, the earliest traditions of the resurrection point toward the empty tomb. Here we would appeal to the Apostle Paul in his writing to the Corinthians. This is dated usually the mid-50s is when Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, what is fascinating is that it would appear in verses 3 and 4 that Paul is passing down something of a creedal statement. In other words, it's, it's not original to him. When Paul says, um, that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Most scholars now recognize for the last 100 or 200 years or so that that is actually a creedal statement. That is something that Paul himself did not come up with, but that has been passed on to him. And now he then is passing it on to the Corinthians. 
And so the question is, well, if Jesus died around the year, raised rather around the year 30 or so, and Paul is writing this in the mid 50s, and this is something not original to him, um, then, then we have to ask, well, how long had this creedal statement been in existence? Who gave it to Paul and who gave it to the person who gave it to Paul? And uh, you can dig these things up, um, but, but there are now scholars that would date 1 Corinthians 15, that creedal statement, all the way back to like the mid 30s. So, um, I mean, we, we are on top of uh, the actual event of the resurrection at that point. And so uh, here's at least seven um, evidences for the resurrection contrary to the swoon theory and the theft theory and the hallucination theory and the wrong tomb theory. So uh, chew on these things, reflect upon these things, think upon these things. I hope that they provoke you to worship as well. God bless you.